The Awakening by Kate Chopin. Part three. Chapters eleven to fifteen. Eleven. What are you doing out here, Edna? I thought I should find you in bed, said her husband, when he discovered her lying there. He had walked up with Madame Lebrun and left her at the house. His wife did not reply. "'Are you asleep?' he asked, bending down close to look at her. "'No.' Her eyes gleamed bright and intense, with no sleepy shadows as they looked into his. "'Do you know it is past one o'clock? Come on!' And he mounted the steps and went into their room. "'Edna!' called Mr. Pontellier from within, after a few moments had gone by. "'Don't wait for me,' she answered. He thrust his head through the door. "'You will take cold out there,' he said irritably. "'What folly is this? Why don't you come in?' "'It isn't cold. I have my shawl.' "'The mosquitoes will devour you.' "'There are no mosquitoes.' She heard him moving about the room, every sound indicating impatience and irritation. Another time she would have gone in at his request. She would, through habit, have yielded to his desire not with any sense of submission or obedience to his compelling wishes, but unthinkingly, as we walk, move, sit, stand, go through the daily treadmill of the life which has been portioned out to us. "'Edna, dear, are you not coming in soon?' he asked again, this time fondly, with a note of entreaty. "'No. I am going to stay out here.' "'This is more than folly,' he blurted out. I can't permit you to stay out there all night. You must come in the house instantly." With a writhing motion she settled herself more securely in the hammock. She perceived that her will had blazed up, stubborn and resistant. She could not at that moment have done other than denied and resisted. She wondered if her husband had ever spoken to her like that before, and if she had submitted to his command. Of course she had. She remembered that she had but she could not realize why or how she should have yielded, feeling as she then did. "'Léonce, go to bed,' she said. "'I mean to stay out here. I don't wish to go in, and I don't intend to. Don't speak to me like that again. I shall not answer you.' Mr. Pontellier had prepared for bed, but he slipped on an extra garment. He opened a bottle of wine, of which he kept a small and select supply in a buffet of his own. He drank a glass of the wine, and went out on the gallery and offered a glass to his wife. She did not wish any. He drew up the rocker, hoisted his slippered feet on the rail, and proceeded to smoke a cigar. He smoked two cigars. Then he went inside and drank another glass of wine. Mrs. Pontellier again declined to accept a glass when it was offered to her. Mr. Pontellier once again seated himself with elevated feet, and after a reasonable interval of time smoked some more cigars. Edna began to feel like one who awakens gradually out of a dream, a delicious, grotesque, impossible dream, to feel again the realities pressing into her soul. The physical need for sleep began to overtake her. The exuberance which had sustained and exalted her spirit left her helpless and yielding to the conditions which crowded her in. The stillest hour of the night had come, the hour before dawn, when the world seems to hold its breath. The moon hung low and had turned from silver to copper in the sleeping sky. The old owl no longer hooted, and the water-oaks had ceased to moan as they bent their heads. Edna arose, cramped from lying so long and still in the hammock. She tottered up the steps, clutching feebly at the post before passing into the house. "'Are you coming in, Léonce?' she asked, turning her face toward her husband. "'Yes, dear,' he answered, with a glance following a misty puff of smoke just as soon as I have finished my cigar. 12. She slept but a few hours. They were troubled and feverish hours, disturbed with dreams that were intangible, that eluded her, leaving only an impression upon her half-awakened senses of something unattainable. She was up and dressed in the cool of the early morning. The air was invigorating, and steadied somewhat her faculties. However, she was not seeking refreshment or help from any source either external or from within. She was blindly following whatever impulse moved her, as if she had placed herself in alien hands for direction, and freed her soul of responsibility. Most of the people at that early hour were still in bed and asleep. 
a few, who intended to go over to the Chenier for mass, were moving about. The lovers, who had laid their plans the night before, were already strolling toward the wharf. The lady in black, with her Sunday prayer-book, velvet and gold-clasped, and her Sunday silver beads, was following them at no great distance. Old Monsieur Faraval was up, and was more than half inclined to do anything that suggested itself. He put on his big straw hat, and taking his umbrella from the stand in the hall, followed the lady in black, never overtaking her. The little negro girl who worked Madame Lebrun's sewing-machine was sweeping the galleries with long, absent-minded strokes of the broom. Edna sent her up into the house to awaken Robert. "'Tell him I am going to the Chenier. The boat is ready. Tell him to hurry.' He had soon joined her. She had never sent for him before. She had never asked for him. She had never seemed to want him before. She did not appear conscious that she had done anything unusual in commanding his presence. He was apparently equally unconscious of anything extraordinary in the situation, but his face was suffused with a quiet glow when he met her. They went together back to the kitchen to drink coffee. There was no time to wait for any nicety of service. They stood outside the window, and the cook passed them their coffee and a roll, which they drank and ate from the window-sill. Edna said it tasted good. She had not thought of coffee, nor of anything. He told her he had often noticed that she lacked forethought. "'Wasn't it enough to think of going to the Chenier and waking you up?' she laughed. "'Do I have to think of everything? As Léant says when he's in a bad humour. I don't blame him. He'd never be in a bad humour if it weren't for me.' They took a short cut across the sands. At a distance they could see the curious procession moving toward the wharf, the lovers, shoulder to shoulder, creeping, the lady in black, gaining steadily upon them, old Monsieur Faraval, losing ground inch by inch, and a young barefooted Spanish girl, with a red kerchief on her head and a basket on her arm, bringing up the rear. Robert knew the girl, and he talked to her a little in the boat. No one present understood what they said. Her name was Mariaquita. She had a round, sly, piquant face, and pretty black eyes. Her hands were small, and she kept them folded over the handle of her basket. Her feet were broad and coarse. She did not strive to hide them. Edna looked at her feet, and noticed the sand and slime between her brown toes. Baudelet grumbled because Mariaquita was there, taking up so much room. In reality he was annoyed at having old Monsieur Faraval, who considered himself the better sailor of the two. But he would not quarrel with so old a man as Monsieur Faraval, so he quarrelled with Mariaquita. The girl was deprecatory at one moment, appealing to Robert. She was saucy the next, moving her head up and down, making eyes at Robert, and making mouths at Baudelet. The lovers were all alone. They saw nothing. They heard nothing. The lady in black was counting her beads for the third time. Old Monsieur Faraval talked incessantly of what he knew about handling a boat, and of what Baudelet did not know on the same subject. Edna liked it all. She looked Mariaquita up and down from her ugly brown toes to her pretty black eyes, and back again. "'Why does she look at me like that?' inquired the girl of Robert. "'Maybe she thinks you are pretty. Shall I ask her?' "'No. Is she your sweetheart?' "'She's a married lady, and has two children.' "'Oh, well, Francisco ran away with Silvano's wife, who had four children. They took all his money and one of the children and stole his boat.' "'Shut up!' Does she understand? Oh, hush! Are those two married over there, leaning on each other? Of course not, laughed Robert. Of course not, echoed Mariaquita, with a serious confirmatory bob of the head. The sun was high up and beginning to bite. The swift breeze seemed to Edna to bury the sting of it into the pores of her face and hands. Robert held his umbrella over her. As they went cutting sidewise through the water, the sails bellied taut, with the wind filling and overflowing them. Old Monsieur Faraval laughed sardonically at something as he looked at the sails, and Baudelet swore at the old man under his breath. Sailing across the bay to the Chenier Caminada, Edna felt as if she were being borne away from some anchorage which had held her fast, whose chains had been loosening had snapped the night before, when the mystic spirit was abroad, leaving her free to drift whithersoever she chose to set her sails. Robert spoke to her incessantly. He no longer noticed Mariaquita. The girl had shrimps in her bamboo basket. They were covered with Spanish moss. She beat the moss down impatiently, 
and muttered to herself sullenly. "'Let us go to Grand Terre to-morrow,' said Robert in a low voice. "'What shall we do there?' "'Climb up to the hill to the old fort, and look at the little wriggling gold snakes, and watch the lizards sun themselves.' She gazed away towards Grand Terre, and thought she would like to be alone there with Robert, in the sun, listening to the ocean's roar, and watching the slimy lizards writhe in and out among the ruins of the old fort. "'And the next day or the next we can sail to the Bayou Brulo,' he went on. "'What shall we do there?' "'Anything. Cast bait for fish.' "'No. We'll go back to Grand Terre. Let the fish alone.' "'We'll go wherever you like,' he said. "'I'll have Tony come over and help me patch and trim my boat. We shall not need Baudelaire, nor any one. Are you afraid of the pirogue?' "'Oh, no.' "'Then I'll take you some night in the pirogue when the moon shines. Maybe your gulf spirit will whisper to you in which of these islands the treasures are hidden, direct you to the very spot, perhaps.' "'And in a day we should be rich,' she laughed. "'I'd give it all to you, the pirate gold and every bit of treasure we could dig up. I think you would know how to spend it. Pirate gold isn't a thing to be hoarded or utilized. It is something to squander and throw to the four winds, for the fun of seeing the golden specks fly. "'We'd share it, and scatter it together,' he said. His face flushed. They all went together up to the quaint little Gothic church of Our Lady of Lourdes, gleaming all brown and yellow with paint in the sun's glare. Only Baudelaire remained behind, tinkering at his boat, and Mariaquita walked away with her basket of shrimps, casting a look of childish ill-humour and reproach at Robert from the corner of her eye. 13. A feeling of oppression and drowsiness overcame Edna during the service. Her head began to ache, and the lights on the altar swayed before her eyes. Another time she might have made an effort to regain her composure, but her one thought was to quit the stifling atmosphere of the church and reach the open air. She arose, climbing over Robert's feet with a muttered apology. Old Monsieur Faraval, flurried, curious, stood up, but upon seeing that Robert had followed Mrs. Pontellier, he sank back into his seat. He whispered an anxious inquiry of the lady in black, who did not notice him or reply, but kept her eyes fastened upon the pages of her velvet prayer-book. "'I felt giddy, and almost overcome,' Edna said, lifting her hands instinctively to her head, and pushing her straw hat up from her forehead. "'I couldn't have stayed through the service.' They were outside in the shadow of the church. Robert was full of solicitude. "'It was folly to have thought of going in the first place, let alone staying. Come over to Madame Antoine's. You can rest there.' He took her arm and led her away, looking anxiously and continuously down into her face. How still it was, with only the voice of the sea whispering through the reeds that grew in the salt-water pools. The long line of little grey, weather-beaten houses nestled peacefully among the orange-trees. It must always have been God's day on that low, drowsy island, Edna thought. They stopped, leaning over a jagged fence made of sea-drift, to ask for water. A youth, a mild-faced Acadian, was drawing water from the cistern, which was nothing more than a rusty buoy, with an opening on one side, sunk in the ground. The water which the youth handed to them in the tin pail was not cold to taste, but it was cool to her heated face, and it greatly revived and refreshed her. Madame Antoine's cottage was at the far end of the village. She welcomed them with all the native hospitality, as she would have opened her door to let the sunlight in. She was fat, and walked heavily and clumsily across the floor. She could speak no English, but when Robert made her understand that the lady who accompanied him was ill and desired to rest, she was all eagerness to make Edna feel at home, and to dispose of her comfortably. The whole place was immaculately clean, and the big four-posted bed, snow-white, invited one to repose. It stood in a small side room which looked out across a narrow grass plot toward the shed, where there was a disabled boat lying keel upward. Madame Antoine had not gone to Mass. Her son Tony had, but she supposed he would be back soon, and she invited Robert to be seated and wait for him. But he went and sat outside the door and smoked. Madame Antoine busied herself in the large front room preparing dinner. She was boiling mullets over a few red coals in the huge fireplace. Edna, left alone in the little side-room, loosened her clothes, removing the greater part of them. She bathed her face, her neck, and arms in the basin that stood between the windows. 
She took off her shoes and stockings and stretched herself in the very centre of the high white bed. How luxurious it felt to rest thus in a strange quaint bed, with its sweet country odour of laurel lingering about the sheets and mattress. She stretched her strong limbs that ached a little. She ran her fingers through her loosened hair for a while. She looked at her round arms as she held them straight up and rubbed them one after the other, observing closely as if it were something she saw for the first time, the fine, firm quality and texture of her flesh. She clasped her hands easily above her head, and it was thus she fell asleep. She slept lightly at first, half awake and drowsily attentive to the things about her. She could hear Madame Antoine's heavy, scraping tread as she walked back and forth on the sanded floor. Some chickens were clucking outside the windows, scratching for bits of gravel in the grass. Later she half heard the voices of Robert and Tony talking under the shed. She did not stir. Even her eyelids rested numb and heavily over her sleepy eyes. The voices went on, Tony's slow Acadian drawl, Robert's quick, soft, smooth French. She understood French imperfectly unless directly addressed, and the voices were only part of the other drowsy, muffled sounds lulling her senses. When Edna awoke, it was with the conviction that she had slept long and soundly. The voices were hushed under the shed. Madame Antoine's step was no longer to be heard in the adjoining room. Even the chickens had gone elsewhere to scratch and cluck. The mosquito bar was drawn over her. The old woman had come in while she slept and let down the bar. Edna arose quietly from the bed, and looking between the curtains of the window, she saw by the slanting rays of the sun that the afternoon was far advanced. Robert was out there under the shed, reclining in the shade against the sloping keel of the overturned boat. He was reading from a book. Tony was no longer with him. She wondered what had become of the rest of the party. She peeped out at him two or three times as she stood washing herself in the little basin between the windows. Madame Antoine had laid some coarse, clean towels upon a chair and had placed a box of poudreries within easy reach. Edna dabbed the powder upon her nose and cheeks as she looked at herself closely in the little distorted mirror which hung on the wall above the basin. Her eyes were bright and wide awake, and her face glowed. When she had completed her toilet, she walked into the adjoining room. She was very hungry. No one was there, but there was a cloth spread upon the table that stood against the wall, and a cover was laid for one, with a crusty brown loaf and a bottle of wine beside the plate. Edna bit a piece from the brown loaf, tearing it with her strong white teeth. She poured some of the wine into the glass and drank it down. Then she went softly out of doors, and plucking an orange from the low-hanging bough of a tree, threw it at Robert, who did not know she was awake and up. An illumination broke over his whole face when he saw her, and joined her under the orange tree. "'How many years have I slept?' she inquired. The whole island seemed changed. A new race of beings must have sprung up, leaving only you and me as past relics. How many ages ago did Madame Antoine and Tony die? And when did our people from Grand Deal disappear from the earth?" He familiarly adjusted a ruffle upon her shoulder. "'You have slept precisely one hundred years. I was left here to guard your slumbers, and for one hundred years I have been out under the shed reading a book. The only evil I couldn't prevent was to keep a broiled fowl from drying up. If it has turned to stone, still will I eat it," said Edna, moving with him into the house. But really, what has become of Monsieur Faraval and the others? Gone hours ago. When they found that you were sleeping, they thought it best not to awake you. Anyway, I wouldn't have let them. What was I here for? I wonder if Léonce will be uneasy," she speculated as she seated herself at table. Of course not. He knows you are with me. Robert replied as he busied himself among sundry pans and covered dishes which had been left standing on the hearth. "'Where are Madame Antoine and her son?' asked Edna. "'Gone to Vespers, and to visit some friends, I believe. I am to take you back in Tony's boat whenever you are ready to go.' He stirred the smouldering ashes till the broiled fowl began to sizzle afresh. He served her with no mean repast, dripping the coffee anew and sharing it with her. Madame Antoine had cooked little else than the mullets but while Edna slept Robert had forged the island. He was childishly gratified to discover her appetite, and to see the relish with which she ate the food she had procured for her. "'Shall we go right away?' she asked, after draining her glass and brushing together the crumbs of the crusty loaf. "'The sun isn't as low as it will be in two hours,' he answered. "'The sun will be gone in two hours.' "'Well, let it go. Who cares?' 
They waited a good while under the orange trees, till Madame Antoine came back, panting, waddling, with a thousand apologies to explain her absence. Tony did not dare to return. He was shy, and would not willingly face any woman except his mother. It was very pleasant to stay there under the orange trees, while the sun dipped lower and lower, turning the western sky to flaming copper and gold. The shadows lengthened and crept out like stealthy, grotesque monsters across the grass. Edna and Robert both sat upon the ground. That is, he lay upon the ground beside her, occasionally picking at the hem of her muslin gown. Madame Antoine seated her fat body, broad and squat, upon a bench beside the door. She had been talking all the afternoon, and had wound herself up to the storytelling pitch. And what story she told them! But twice in her life she had left the Chenier Caminada, and then for the briefest span. All her years she had squatted and waddled there upon the island, gathering legends of the Baratarians and the sea. The night came on, with the moon to lighten it. Edna could hear the whispering voices of dead men, and the click of muffled gold. When she and Robert stepped into Tony's boat, with the red lateen sail, misty spirit forms were prowling in the shadows and among the reeds, and upon the water were phantom ships speeding to cover. 14. The youngest boy, Etienne, had been very naughty, Madame Ratignolle said, as she delivered him into the hands of his mother. He had been unwilling to go to bed, and had made a scene, whereupon she had taken charge of him, and pacified him as well as she could. Raoul had been in bed and asleep for two hours. The youngster was in his long white nightgown, that kept tripping him up as Madame Ratignolle led him along by the hand. With the other chubby fist he rubbed his eyes, which were heavy with sleep and ill-humour. Edna took him in her arms, and seating herself in the rocker, began to coddle and caress him, calling him all manner of tender names, soothing him to sleep. It was not more than nine o'clock. No one had yet gone to bed but the children. Léonce had been very uneasy at first, Madame Ratignolle said and had wanted to start at once for the Chenier. But M. Ferreval had assured him that his wife was only overcome with sleep and fatigue, that Tony would bring her safely back later in the day, and he had thus been dissuaded from crossing the bay. He had gone over to Klein's, looking up some cotton-broker whom he wished to see in regard to securities, exchanges, stocks, bonds, or something of the sort. Madame Ratignolle did not remember what. He said he would not remain away late. She herself was suffering from heat and oppression, she said. She carried a bottle of salts and a large fan. She would not consent to remain with Edna, for M. Ratignolle was alone, and he detested above all things to be left alone. When Etienne had fallen asleep, Edna bore him into the back room, and Robert went and lifted the mosquito-bar that she might lay the child comfortably in his bed. The quadroon had vanished. When they emerged from the cottage, Robert bade Edna good-night. "'Do you know we have been together the whole live-long day, Robert, since early this morning?' she said at parting. All but the hundred years when you were sleeping. Good night. He pressed her hand and went away in the direction of the beach. He did not join any of the others, but walked alone toward the gulf. Edna stayed outside, awaiting her husband's return. She had no desire to sleep or to retire, nor did she feel like going over to sit with the Ratignolles, or to join Madame Lebrun and a group whose animated voices reached her as they sat in conversation before the house. She let her mind wander back over her stay at Grand Isle, and she tried to discover wherein this summer had been very different from any and every other summer of her life. She could only realize that she herself, her present self, was in some way different from the other self. That she was seeing with different eyes, and making the acquaintance of new conditions in herself that colored and changed her environment, she did not yet suspect. She wondered why Robert had gone away and left her. It did not occur to her to think he might have grown tired of being with her the live-long day. She was not tired, and she felt that he was not. She regretted that he had gone. It was so much more natural to have him stay, when he was not absolutely required to leave her. As Edna waited for her husband, she sang low a little song that Robert had sung as they crossed the bay. It began with, Ah, si tu savais, and every verse ended with, si tu savais. Robert's voice was not pretentious. It was musical and true. The voice, the notes, the whole refrain haunted her memory. 15. When Edna entered the dining-room one evening a little late, as was her habit, an unusually animated conversation seemed to be going on. 
Several persons were talking at once, and Victor's voice was predominating, even over that of his mother. Edna had returned late from her bath, had dressed in some haste, and her face was flushed. Her head, set off by her dainty white gown, suggested a rich, rare blossom. She took her seat at table between old Monsieur Varival and Madame Ratignolle. As she seated herself and was about to begin to eat her soup, which had been served when she entered the room, several persons informed her simultaneously that Robert was going to Mexico. She laid her spoon down and looked about her, bewildered. He had been with her, reading to her all the morning, and had never even mentioned such a place as Mexico. She had not seen him during the afternoon. She had heard some one say he was at the house, upstairs with his mother. This she had thought nothing of, though she was surprised when he did not join her later in the afternoon, when she went down to the beach. She looked across at him, where he sat beside Madame Lebrun, who presided. Edna's face was a blank picture of bewilderment, which she never thought of disguising. He lifted his eyebrows with the pretext of a smile as he returned her glance. He looked embarrassed and uneasy. "'When is he going?' she asked of everybody in general, as if Robert were not there to answer for himself. "'Tonight! This very evening! Did you ever! What possesses him?' were some of the replies she gathered, uttered simultaneously in French and English. "'Impossible!' she exclaimed. "'How can a person start off from Grand Isle to Mexico at a moment's notice, as if he were going over to Klein's, or to the wharf, or down to the beach?' "'I said all along I was going to Mexico. I've been saying so for years,' cried Robert, in an excited and irritable tone, with the air of a man defending himself against a swarm of stinging insects. Madame Lebrun knocked on the table with her knife-handle. "'Please let Robert explain why he is going, and why he is going to-night,' she called out. "'Really, this table is getting to be more and more like bedlam every day, with everybody talking at once. Sometimes—' I hope God will forgive me, but positively sometimes I wish Victor would lose the power of speech." Victor laughed sardonically as he thanked his mother for her holy wish, of which he failed to see the benefit to anybody, except that it might afford her a more ample opportunity and license to talk herself. M. Farival thought that Victor should have been taken out in mid-ocean in his earliest youth and drowned. Victor thought there would be more logic in thus disposing of old people, with an established claim for making themselves universally obnoxious. Madame Lebrun grew a trifle hysterical. Robert called his brother some sharp, hard names. "'There's nothing much to explain, mother,' he said, though he explained, nevertheless, looking chiefly at Edna, that he could only meet the gentleman whom he intended to join at Vera Cruz by taking such and such a steamer which left New Orleans on such a day, that Baudelaire was going out with his lugger load of vegetables that night, which gave him an opportunity of reaching the city and making his vessel in time. "'But when did you make up your mind to do all this?' demanded M. Parival. "'This afternoon,' returned Robert, with a shade of annoyance. "'At what time this afternoon?' persisted the old gentleman, with nagging determination, as if he were cross-questioning a criminal in a court of justice. "'At four o'clock this afternoon, M. Farival,' Robert replied, in a high voice and with a lofty air, which reminded Edna of some gentleman on the stage. She had forced herself to eat most of her soup, and now she was picking the flaky bits of a court bouillon with her fork. The lovers were profiting by the general conversation on Mexico, to speak in whispers of matters which they rightly considered were interesting to no one but themselves. The lady in black had once received a pair of prayer-beads of curious workmanship from Mexico, with very special indulgence attached to them, but she had never been able to ascertain whether the indulgence extended outside the Mexican border. Father Focal of the cathedral had attempted to explain it, but he had not done so to her satisfaction. And she begged that Robert would interest himself, and discover, if possible, whether she was entitled to the indulgence accompanying the remarkably curious Mexican prayer-beads. Madame Ratignolle hoped that Robert would exercise extreme caution in dealing with the Mexicans, who, she considered, were a treacherous people, unscrupulous and revengeful. She trusted she did them no injustice in thus condemning them as a race. She had known personally but one Mexican, who made and sold excellent tamales, and whom she would have trusted implicitly, so soft-spoken was he. One day he was arrested for stabbing his wife. She never knew whether he had been hanged or not. Victor had grown hilarious, and was attempting to tell an anecdote about a Mexican girl who served chocolate one winter in a restaurant in Dauphine Street. No one would listen to him but old Monsieur Farival, who went into convulsions over the droll story. 
Edna wondered if they had all gone mad to be talking and clamoring at that rate. She herself could think of nothing to say about Mexico or the Mexicans. "'At what time do you leave?' she asked Robert. "'At ten, he told her. "'Baudelaire wants to wait for the moon.' "'Are you all ready to go?' "'Quite ready. I shall only take a handbag, and shall pack my trunk in the city.' He turned to answer some question put to him by his mother, and Edna, having finished her black coffee, left the table. She went directly to her room. The little cottage was close and stuffy after leaving the outer air. But she did not mind. There appeared to be a hundred different things demanding her attention indoors. She began to set the toilet-stand to rights, grumbling at the negligence of the quadroon, who was in the adjoining room putting the children to bed. She gathered together stray garments that were hanging on the backs of chairs, and put each where it belonged in closet or bureau drawer. She changed her gown for a more comfortable and commodious wrapper. She rearranged her hair, combing and brushing it with unusual energy. Then she went in and assisted the quadroon in getting the boys to bed. They were very playful and inclined to talk, to do anything but lie quiet and go to sleep. Edna sent the quadroon away to her supper, and told her she need not return. Then she sat and told the children a story. Instead of soothing it excited them, and added to their wakefulness. She left them in heated argument, speculating about the conclusion of the tale which their mother promised to finish the following night. The little black girl came in to say that Madame Lebrun would like to have Mrs. Pontellier go and sit with them over at the house till Mr. Robert went away. Edna returned answer that she had already undressed, that she did not feel quite well, but perhaps she would go over to the house later. She started to dress again, and got as far advanced as to remove her peignoir, but changing her mind once more she resumed the peignoir, and went outside and sat down before her door. She was overheated and irritable, and fanned herself energetically for a while. Madame Ratignolle came down to discover what was the matter. "'All that noise and confusion at the table must have upset me,' replied Edna. "'And moreover, I hate shocks and surprises. The idea of Robert starting off in such a ridiculously sudden and dramatic way, as if it were a matter of life and death, never saying a word about it all morning when he was with me.' "'Yes,' agreed Madame Ratignolle. "'I think it was showing us all, you especially, very little consideration. It wouldn't have surprised me in any of the others. Those Le Brun are all given to heroics. But I must say I should never have expected such a thing from Robert. Are you not coming down? Come on, dear. He doesn't look friendly." No, said Edna, a little sullenly. I can't go to the trouble of dressing again. I don't feel like it. You needn't dress. You look all right. Fasten a belt around your waist. Just look at me. No, persisted Edna. But you go on. Madame Lebrun might be offended if we both stayed away." Madame Ratignolle kissed Edna good-night, and went away, being in truth rather desirous of joining in the general and animated conversation which was still in progress concerning Mexico and the Mexicans. Somewhat later Robert came up, carrying his handbag. "'Aren't you feeling well?' he asked. "'Oh, well enough. Are you going right away?' He lit a match and looked at his watch. "'In twenty minutes,' he said. The sudden and brief flare of the match emphasized the darkness for a while. He sat down upon a stool which the children had left out on the porch. "'Get a chair,' said Edna. "'This will do,' he replied. He put on his soft hat and nervously took it off again, and wiping his face with his handkerchief, complained of the heat. "'Take the fan,' said Edna, offering it to him. "'Oh, no, thank you. It does no good. You have to stop fanning some time, and feel all the more uncomfortable afterward.' That's one of the ridiculous things which men always say. I have never known one to speak otherwise of fanning. How long will you be gone? Forever, perhaps. I don't know. It depends upon a good many things. Well, in case it shouldn't be forever, how long will it be? I don't know. This seems to me perfectly preposterous and uncalled for. I don't like it. I don't understand your motive for silence and mystery, never saying a word to me about it this morning. He remained silent, not offering to defend himself. He said only, after a moment, "'Don't part from me in any ill humour. I never knew you to be out of patience with me before.' "'I don't want to part in any ill humour,' she said. "'But can't you understand? I have grown used to seeing you, to having you with me all the time, and your action seems unfriendly, even unkind. You don't even offer an excuse for it. Why, I was planning to be together thinking of how pleasant it would be to see you in the city next winter." "'So was I. 
he blurted. "'Perhaps that's the—' He stood up suddenly and held out his hand. "'Good-bye, my dear Mrs. Pontellier. Good-bye. You won't—I hope you won't completely forget me.' She clung to his hand, striving to detain him. "'Write to me when you get there. Won't you, Robert?' she entreated. "'I will. Thank you. Good-bye.' How unlike Robert! The merest acquaintance would have said something more emphatic than, I will thank you, good-bye, to such a request. He had evidently already taken leave of the people over at the house, for he descended the steps and went to join Baudelaire, who was out there with an oar across his shoulder waiting for Robert. They walked away in the darkness. She could only hear Baudelaire's voice. Robert had apparently not even spoken a word of greeting to his companion. Edna bit her handkerchief convulsively striving to hold back and to hide, even from herself as she would have hidden from another, the emotion which was troubling, tearing her. Her eyes were brimming with tears. For the first time she recognized the symptoms of infatuation, which she had felt incipiently as a child, as a girl in her earliest teens, and later as a young woman. The recognition did not lessen the reality, the poignancy of the revelation by any suggestion or promise of instability. The past was nothing to her offered no lesson which she was willing to heed. The future was a mystery which she never attempted to penetrate. The present alone was significant, was hers, to torture her as it was doing then with the biting conviction that she had lost that which she had held, that she had been denied that which her impassioned, newly awakened being demanded. End of Part Three